Good evening, dear friends. We are back once again to Who is Who in the Bible, praying with biblical characters. This evening, you will hear of a man called Jeroboam. I don't think many of you have heard of him, an unfamiliar character, but let me assure you, a very significant man in the history of Israel. I want you to form an impression of the man as we go along, and then in your appraisal at the end, I want to make your own decision on what you think of him. Dear Lord, you call each one of us by name. You place us in the world, in our families, in society, in the world at large, to, fill, to fulfill a function that you give us. We often succeed, sometimes fail, but we continue to remain your children. We thank you, dear Father, for what you have made of each one of us. Help us understand this evening the character of Jeroboam so that our study may be fruitful and that we may be able to apply it to our own life. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Dear friends, as I said, the character of Jeroboam is probably unfamiliar to you. But you will need, therefore, to form impressions of the man after you have heard the whole story. I would like to present the story of Jeroboam in five scenes. The first scene, Jeroboam, a king in the making. Scene two, the negotiation between Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and Jeroboam. Scene three, Jeroboam, the new Moses, leading the ten northern tribes to their freedom. Scene four, the unfolding of freedom, the shattering of a dream. And the final scene, Jeroboam, an appraisal, an assessment of the character. Let's speak about the first scene, Jeroboam, a king in the making. Jeroboam is an Ephraimite. That means he belongs to the tribe of Ephraim, one of the northern tribes. Ephraim was a son of Joseph. He has been educated by his widowed mother. He happens to come under the gaze of Solomon, who observes him to be a man of valor and extremely industrious. And therefore, he appoints Jeroboam in charge of the security of the Jerusalem city. He asks him to mend the breaches in the wall of Jerusalem and then to erect a fortress at the gate of the city of Jerusalem. Besides that, he also appoints him as a taskmaster over the house of Joseph. And it is when he is a taskmaster, he comes to know firsthand of a widespread discontent among the workers against Solomon that Solomon has placed upon them an oppressive tax system. Very slowly, Jeroboam begins to understand their concerns and he takes them seriously and gradually a conspiracy develops against Solomon. Now, how does Jeroboam proceed to take the conspiracy forward? It is at this point 
Jeroboam realizes that he is on the right track when the prophet Ahijah tells him of his royal vocation. This seems to, this seems to come at just at the right moment. The prophet in a very symbolic gesture makes this known to Jeroboam. Let me read for you 1 Kings 11, 30 to 31. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. Dear friends, is the prophet suggesting a division in the kingdom of David? If he is, how can he? Didn't God tell David that your kingdom will last forever? That's what Samuel had told David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 15. How can the kingdom of David be now divided? It is then that the Lord explains to prophet Ahijah the prophet, Ahijah, to prophet Ahijah, this is what he says in relation to Solomon, 1 Kings 12, 33. Because they have forsaken me, worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as his father David did, as his father David did, whose father? Solomon's father. He implies, God implies that Solomon is at fault. This is a solemn indictment, rebuke against Solomon. And now, therefore, dear friends, Solomon must pay for his folly. At that moment, Solomon becomes aware of Jeroboam provoking rebellion, and he wants to execute him. So what does Jeroboam do? Jeroboam does exactly what David did when Saul wanted to execute him. Similar circumstances. Now where will Jeroboam go? Where will he flee? Who will give him refuge? Because that man, the one who gives him refuge, will have to answer Solomon. Who is strong enough to answer Solomon at that point in time? There's only one man who is strong enough at that moment to give refuge to Jeroboam. And that man is Pharaoh Shisak of Egypt. Now, the Pharaoh had reasons to support Jeroboam against Solomon. Mind you, Jeroboam remains in Egypt for 16 years. And in the meanwhile, the Pharaoh gives his sister-in-law in marriage to Jeroboam. And to them, a son is born. They name him Abijah. Please differentiate the name Abijah from an earlier name you heard of the prophet Haijah. This is B, that is H. Abijah, Haijah. Now we come to scene two. The negotiation between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. After the death of Solomon, dear friends, the ten northern tribes request Jeroboam to represent them and negotiate with Rehoboam to lighten the tax burdens that his father Solomon has placed on them. The meeting is held in the northern Israel at a place called Shechem. And Jeroboam makes this petition to Rehoboam. I'll read for you 1 Kings 12, 4. Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us and we will serve you. 
What is Jeroboam saying? We don't mind serving you, but lighten our burdens. How does Rehoboam answer? This is his last chance to have a united monarchy. He took counsel with two groups of people, Rehoboam did. The first counsel he took from a group of old men who had served his father Solomon. What did they tell Rehoboam? 1 Kings 12, 7. If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. They will not leave you. As if not satisfied with this counsel given by the older men, Rehoboam now turns to another group of men, the younger men who were uh, with him, with whom he had grown up with. What did they tell him? They asked Rehoboam to tell Jeroboam this. My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. 1 Kings Chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. What's the meaning of this, dear friends? My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. Of course, the little finger has sexual implications. But how unfortunate that Rehoboam listened to the counsel of the younger men. And the result? What do you expect? The result it's the end of the negotiation. There is no negotiation. And the ten tribes withdraw and declare independence. From now on, there will be the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom comprising of ten tribes. Now we come to scene three. Jeroboam, the new Moses, leading the ten tribes to their freedom. The ten tribes look to Jeroboam as their leader. He is their second Moses. He is the one who will liberate them from the oppressor, if not from Solomon, because he's dead, from Rehoboam, his son. Just as Moses led the people of Israel from the oppression of Pharaoh and his building projects. So Rehoboam will now lead the tribes away from the colossal projects of Rehoboam in Jerusalem. So what is the story all about? This story, dear friends, is a repeat of the story of Moses and the Pharaoh. The new Pharaoh is Solomon and Rehoboam. See the striking comparisons between the Moses narrative and that of Jeroboam. The comparisons are very striking. The Israelites built store cities for the Pharaoh in Egypt. Now Solomon pressed the Jews into forced labor to build him the temple, his own palace, the Milo, the walls of Jerusalem, and three and three other cities. Second, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses and now Solomon tries to kill Jeroboam. Third, when the Pharaoh died, Moses returned to Egypt from Midian. When Solomon dies, Jeroboam returns back to Jerusalem from Egypt. The fourth point, Moses was chosen by God. Jeroboam is also chosen by God through the prophet Ahijah. The fifth point, Moses petitions Pharaoh, let my people go. Similarly, Jeroboam petitions Rehoboam. Now therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke upon us. The sixth point, the appeals of both Moses and Rehoboam fall on deaf ears. 
What did the Pharaoh do? Pharaoh ta charged the taskmasters saying, you shall no longer provide the people with straw in order to make bricks. Let them produce the same number of bricks without, let them find the straw for themselves. Let heavier work be laid upon the men. What does Rehoboam say? He replies, my father Solomon made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. Dear friends, we come to the next scene, scene four, the unfolding of freedom, the shattering of a dream. It is said, build your life on your dreams because dreams never have a bad endings. But what when you wake up to reality? Jeroboam with 10 tribes, they're on their way to form the new kingdom of Israel. An important question that comes to mind, were Jeroboam and the 10 tribes justified in wanting a schism, a separation from the kingdom of Judah? What would you say? I don't want you to answer immediately, but think of the question. Let's hear the facts of the case. Why do we examine the facts of the case? Because not everything will go on well from now on with the northern kingdom. Jeroboam will be accused of having sinned against the Lord. He is the one who wanted to take the people to their freedom. Away from Rehoboam. Later, other kings will be targeted. They will be branded as walking in the way of Jeroboam ben Nebat, the son of Nebat. The facts of the case are simple. The divine sanction for the separation has already been given by Prophet Ahijah. The next thing is you saw how Rehoboam shamefully treated the ten tribes represented by Jeroboam. Yet, scripture speaks of the sin of Jeroboam. What is the sin of Jeroboam? After his coronation, he commissioned the creation, I believe, of two golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Bethel is in the southern extremity of the northern kingdom and Dan in the northern extremity of the kingdom. Why? Because he did not want the people of the northern kingdom to visit the south to the newly constructed temple of Solomon. Let me read for you 1 Kings 12:27. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Jeroboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So Jeroboam does not want the people to resume their allegiance to the house of David. He wanted them instead to offer worship in the local shrines in Bethel or Dan. But how could he do this? Wasn't it idolatrous to worship bull calves? But Jeroboam, mind you, is not introducing something new. It is said that these shrines existed in Israel from the time of the judges, when they came through the wilderness from Egypt to the promised land, they entered Canaan and they carried the ark with them. The ark needed a place of rest. And the ark was kept in a shrine in Bethel, later on shifted to Shiloh. But the important question is that when the ark was shifted from one shrine to another, the priest said, the presence of God has been there in the shrine. And therefore, let us ensure that this presence continues. And they built a pedestal in the shrine. Like a bull calf to designate or to suggest that Yahweh had once been here in this shrine. And therefore, the question is, is that pedestal suggestive of 
a new deity. So as far as Jeroboam is concerned, dear friends, the shrines already contain the presence of Yahweh. And that is enough. Why do you want to go to Jerusalem in order to meet Yahweh the Lord? And therefore, Jeroboam's action was not an innovation, but rather a restoration of an old cultic practice when the ark moved from shrine to shrine before the temple was built. Perhaps Jeroboam is not blatantly idolatrous, as we may think he is. Another reason why I think that way is because a few years later, when Elijah appears on the scene, he didn't say anything about these shrines. He does not connect them with idol worship at all, the way he corrects Ahab, for example, over Baal worship. But the problem comes from the Levites in and around Bethel and Dan who refused to conduct their priestly duties at the altar of the calves. And therefore, what did Jer Jeroboam do? He appointed laymen instead to replace them. And this was an act of defiance against the tribe of Levi, who held the priestly office since the time of Moses. Moses himself belonged to the tribe of Levi. And their privileges had already been enshrined in the Torah. He even changed the timing of the biblically mandated Feast of Tabernacles. The question, therefore, dear friends, is simple. Were the bull calves just a pedestal for Yahweh the Lord? Or did they actually symbolize a deity? Therefore, and per se, an object of worship. We come to the final scene, Jeroboam and appraisal. The 10 tribes on their way to freedom, to independence, they wake up finally from their dream to reality. And it is at that moment, their discontents surface. You cannot run away from this. How, so how would you judge Jeroboam, guilty, not guilty. He prevented people from going to Jerusalem temple because he wanted to secure the autonomy of his kingdom. That was the reason. 1 Kings 12, 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. And he was afraid of that. So use the local shrines that are there in the northern kingdom. You ask them, you try to stop the people and trying to stop them from going to Jerusalem, I believe was a misstep of an otherwise positive king who had saved his people, don't forget, from the oppression of Solomon and Rehoboam. But at the end, neither Solomon nor Jeroboam measured up to the stature, the model of David. This is what the Lord told Jeroboam, 1 Kings 14, 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet you have not been like my servant David who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. What about Solomon? How did he conduct himself? 1 Kings 11.6 So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Each successive king will be measured according to the stature of the founder king, David. He is the standard. In the end, 
the kingdom of David is meant to stand because of the promise made to him by Samuel, made by God through Samuel, that his kingdom would last forever. But the kingdom of Israel is slated for destruction. Why? Because each successive king walked in the way of Jeroboam ben Nebat. We know that, dear friends, in the history of the northern kingdom, from the time of Jeroboam who began it, to the time of his destruction by Sargon II in the year 722, it's a 210 year period. And during this 210 years, there will be 19 kings. And of these 19 kings, 16 of them are said to have walked in the way of Jeroboam ben Nebat. Let me remind you, 210 years, total number of kings, 19. But these 19 kings belong to nine different dynasties. That is the story of the northern kingdom. That comes to an end earlier in 722. What about the kingdom of David? The fate or the survival of a kingdom is determined by the behavior of the first king or the founder king. In the case of the south, David is the founder king. He is pious. Therefore, Judah stood. Jeroboam, the founder of the northern kingdom, sinned. Therefore, Israel fell. Jeroboam failed to be like David. He was looked upon as an archetype of evil. In the end, the Lord removed him, removed Israel from his presence. Whereas Judah remained for 430 years, almost twice the length, uh, the, uh, the duration of the northern kingdom, which is 210 years, the southern kingdom of Judah, 430 years, again identically, 19 kings occupy the throne of Jerusalem in the south. But all the 19 kings belong to one and the same dynasty, the dynasty of David. Whereas in the north, they belong to nine different dynasties. Dear friends, whose life convinces you to be the correct one? When we really study the Bible, we learn its complexities, diversities, ambiguities. At the end, we are, you might say, confused. How can we arrive at an appraisal? Who provides the way forward? Is it Solomon? Rehoboam? Jeroboam? Before we answer that question, let me put to you a pastoral question. Let us look at our own families. We too walk away from our family at certain moment of our life, either for the marriage or for some reason or the other, we walk away. But how we do that, that is important. Does love and unity sustain even when we have walked away? So that when we can come together, we remember that we are still one. But that is not the way how it happened with the people of Israel. Remember, dear friends, the chosen people of God were also a family. The moment the ten brothers decided to separate and walk away from Judah, they walked the way of Jeroboam. Neither Solomon, nor Rehoboam, nor Jeroboam remain good role models for us. What about David? Is he a saint? No, none of them provide a way forward. None of us as Christians can say we walk the way of David. No, we walk the way of Jesus of Nazareth. As Christians, we speak of the way of the Lord. We are called to walk in the way of the man from Galilee. Because when we walk the way of Jesus, there is no ambiguity. There is no confusion. 
Yes, it is the way of the cross. But that way of the cross, dear friends, ends in the resurrection of Jesus. And that is what gives us hope. The way of Jesus. And therefore, Jesus tells you and me, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Dear friends, at this moment, let us pray. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to guide our steps to walk this way of Jesus, the way of the cross, without faltering, so that we reach the author of life. Amen. Dear friends, I would like at this moment to give you the blessing of God Almighty. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with you abide with you now and forever thank you thank you for being here this evening have a good evening god bless you.